Hi all, let's have a look at game five of that amazing research paper for Alpha Zero against Stockfish. So game five, Alpha Zero playing white, Stockfish playing black. D4, Knight F6, Knight F3, E6, C4, B6. So we go into Queen's Indian territory. Bishop E7 here, Bishop G2, Bishop B7, both sides castle. This continuation though from black does allow d5 here which is a very very dynamic aggressive move it's a move which has been played by the likes of Kasparov in similar positions if not this exact position so here even knight c3 hasn't been played black took that and we have knight h4 so the knight's going to that dangerous f5 square which, as we know, uh, a knight on f5 is very, very dangerous. It's Kasparov's favourite square for an attacking knight. And it's called by some GMs like Ben Feingold, knife f5. So the whole point of this pawn sack is knife f5 at the moment. So this pawn is pinned to that bishop. We see c6. C takes d5. And black doesn't want doubled pawns. So knight takes d5. Hitting the knight. So this is... The knight getting out of the way of that, going into that lovely square. Knight c7. Black's pieces are a bit huddled over here. Now, it may be that Alpha Zero, in its training period of four hours, uh, can, had games like this where it considered white was just better or winning most of the game. So maybe this is just part of its evolved book. We do know that it kind of discarded as black things like the French defense quite quickly and then the Karakon and then settled on Berlin but as white it settled on the English opening uh, as well as d4 uh, Catalan stuff well this this kind of stuff so this could have been part of the product of that four hours this this kind of gambit does seem uh, intuitively to offer quite a bit of compensation for white we have bishop f6 and now knight d6, actually. Now you might think this knight could be a target later potentially to knight e8. So let's see what happens here. Bishop a6, the rook moves. Now knight e8, so targeting that knight. If the knight just retreats to f5, then d6 and black should be, uh, well, a small disadvantage only. But in fact, the way white plays this is e5. This is quite remarkable now. We're going from the standard sort of gambit that's pretty understood to get a knife on f5, the knight on f5, but to, to another gambit now, which is a little bit more subtle here. After knight takes d6, white's intention is not to take the knight with the queen. If queen takes, then we have queen e7 for black, for example. And if this, this is just going to be good for black, Black's going to have a small edge here. That wasn't the intention at all. The intention is actually uh, to play e takes f6, which represents another pawn sack. So two pawns gambited here out of the opening. So this is actually really incredible stuff. Alpha Zero can play very, very dynamic, aggressive chess. And it still must have considered this position highly favorable for white based on its learning. And yeah, it's just very, very interesting. Knight c3, bishop c4 was played. h4, so setting up things like bishop g5 here. h6, preventing bishop g5. Now b3, which represents a third gambited pawn potentially, because after queen takes c3, Bishop f4, white's also a piece down temporarily, but two pieces are hanging. Knight b7, and now white takes here. And in fact, it seems at a certain depth, queen takes c4 seemed like a, a viable move, which would be three pawns. But you can see white's compensation is, is getting pretty large here. Black, in fact, played queen f6, avoiding that. Bishop e4, centralizing the bishop, pointing at the king side. Knight a6. And now, bishop e5. So both bishops impressively centralized. Look at the bishops versus the knights. It's quite an aesthetic impression here. If queen takes, then there's bishop h7 check to win the queen. 
So bishop e5 kicks the queen. Bishop d3, threatening bishop takes g7 now to hit the queen. Black parries that with f6. We have bishop d4 hitting the queen. So the rook's now hit. Queen f7. Queen g4, which means actually bishop g4 is pretty dangerous. Sorry, bishop g6 is pretty dangerous. We see rook fd8, which actually leaves f8 for the queen. It vacates that f8 square. If, for example, we had rook a d8, this is just really bad because bishop g6, if the queen is not guarding e7, this infiltration is a bit of a killer because we're now threatening with white bishop h7 check. So, for example, knight d6, bishop h7 check and mating. So the queen's got to guard here e7. And so that's quite nifty from uh, Stockfish. It seems to give, you know, f8 to the queen. Rook e3, white simply is going to double here, it seems. Any rook e8, there's bishop g6 skewing the queen against the, the rook. Knight c5, we see bishop g6 now. Queen f8 guarding e7 for dear life. Rook a d1. Rook a b8. King g2. So if we look at this position, black's really passive. Look at these bishops, they're tying up the black position. Knight e6, bishop drops back, knight bc5, and the rooks just double. So white's position is pretty harmonious. The rooks ready for infiltration potentially to e7. A door needs to be opened though there. Knight a4 to get into e7. Bishop drops back, king h8, but this door is about to be opened with f4 now, f5 for rook e7. Queen d6. Hitting the bishop. Bishop moves back. Knight d4. Black's playing with his knights a little bit. But now we do get the infiltration. Rook e7. So yeah, even though white is two pawns down, this just seems very, very dangerous now. The king safety element is being increasingly magnified bit by bit with this rook infiltration to e7 now. Black plays a desperate move to try and defend things. F5, giving back a pawn. It just smacks of computer desperation a little bit. If knight c3, then we see, can you guess? If I give you five seconds. There'll be rook takes g7 here. And for example, bishop d3 check. F5 is crashing through. You see that the rook's cutting off the escape squares here. We've got bishop takes h6 now. And this is a lost position for black. Black could try and only defend for a little bit. And it's just it's just massacre time. So yeah, this, this is really dangerous, this position where black has to play this kind of desperate looking counter pawn sack. And with this, white's getting back some material, of course. Defending g7 here. So queen takes, but now white is threatening queen f7, basically. That would be extremely dangerous. Black plays rook f8, giving up a second pawn to try and counter things. If, for example, b5, queen f7, queen f6, this is just better for white. This kind of position where this bishop's going to take on h6 potentially. This ends up being very nice for white. Very dangerous for the rook switching. It's it's just too dangerous for black. So yeah, black gives up a second pawn basically with rook f8 because rook takes d7 now. And this end game is just better for white. White has recovered the investment of the two pawns. And we see a three to two pawn majority and black now is suffering here a big space squish on the king's side. So g5 now, knight c5, king centralizes, rook moves back from that attack, c4 is attacked so that's protected. Nice diagonal for the bishop and you can see that the bishop is lovely here in conjunction with potential f5 and g6 later when prepared. In fact, g6 now, king g4, 
Knight d4 was played. This is another desperate kind of pawn sack. Black's just giving up pawns to try and recover the positional deficits. If rook b c eight, f five, this is just going to be nasty for black. If black doesn't do anything, he'll just get run over with this kind of thing. Uh, black would have to give up the exchange or a piece here or both. So yeah, uh, if black doesn't want to get run over, he has it has to do something. So this is another trying to sort of balance the positional deficits. But white ignores that for a moment. And it's here that the knight is taken. And now we see King G5. So white's just making steady progress in this ending, increasing the advantage, consolidating the advantage. It's just steady squeeze here, positional squeeze. It's really technique from here, really. It's uh, a dominating uh, position, nothing really black can do. So taking another pawn, finally material up. Well, has been material up for a bit, actually. Just two pawns up now. Making more inroads. And here, uh, the operators must have resigned, so that moves 70. So we see here, this seems to be an Achilles heel, actually, in the repertoire of Stockfish, when it isn't playing without its opening book, that this Queen's engine, this initial pawn sacrifice, is actually really dynamically dangerous for black, especially when it's like this game. It leads to another pawn sack, which gives white the bishop pair an infiltration point on e7. Then king safety issues start to be magnified. And black desperately trying to give up material to try and neutralize that stuff, but just led to a lost end game. So a very impressive positional performance. Very deep dynamic understanding is shown in this game, I believe, by Alpha Zero. And yeah, this self-training method, I think, sets the tone for mastering all other games in similar scenarios where there's perfect information, basically. This is a fantastic uh, example of, of that. Okay, comments, questions, likes, shares, appreciated. Thanks very much.